This is the Flowering of the Middle Ages, History 4330, Week 10. Uh, all of you remembered, of course, that your papers are due tonight or today. If you're watching on KUHT, you need to get your papers in uh, today. Either mail them today or uh, bring them into the History Department today. Okay, last week we looked at the Medieval Manuscript Book, Monastic Schools and Universities, and we looked at the technology and chemistry of books, which was interesting that we actually had a chemistry component to this class. I was glad to see that. We also saw a history of illuminated manuscripts, and we looked at book covers and script. Then we looked at the rise of monastic schools, and if you recall, what was stressed in the monastic schools was grammar, humanism, and reason. And, and so we saw the rise of reason for the first time with Berengar of Tours and St. Anselm. Then we looked at the rise of universities, and this was a turn in a really different direction. Uh, the universities, unlike the monastic schools, were centered on the cathedrals in the city. And a university was a guild, like the Butcher's Guild or the Baker's Guild. A university was a corporation, not a collection of buildings. In the universities, the trivium and quadrivium were restored, and the university was an association of scholars and students, as I said. Uh, when the trivium and quadrivium were restored, mathematics, music, astronomy, and geometry were once again higher education. They were studied in the universities. And one of the interesting things that was studied was alchemy. A lot of people got involved in alchemy. Uh, one of the most famous alchemists was Roger Bacon, who was really pushing the envelope. And we've seen pushing the envelope as a real theme in this course. Roger Bacon uh, wrote a tract that outlined the experimental method of doing science, uh, which is the modern method of doing science. Uh, he also did, uh, he also wrote a tract on technology. And I want to read to you um, uh, something that Roger Bacon said. That writing in, in 1260, Roger Bacon said, Machines may be made by which the largest ships, with only one man steering them, will be moved faster than if they were filled with rowers. Wagons may be built which will move with incredible speed and without the aid of beasts. Flying machines can be constructed in which a man may beat the air with wings like a bird. Machines will make it possible to go to the bottom of seas and rivers. Well, what is he describing here? airplanes, submarines, cars, locomotives. And so he was a, a, he was a predictor of the future that European technology would take. He was really pushing the envelope. Uh, let's recall the manuscripts that we saw. If we could look on the slate here, here is the manuscript. And I want to show you, uh, here is a mother teaching her child in the university. I want to show you this, uh, this book cover, um, which is a uh, painting of it, so you can see what the book cover is like. And then we'll go to our lecture for today. Here is Roger Bacon. We can see the portrait of Roger Bacon, okay, briefly. And the lecture for today is on peasants, and here are some peasants. And the lecture will be by Carl Lindahl from the English Department on Medieval Folklore. Okay. See, I am a folklorist, even though I'm in the English Department, and I do teach medieval literature, such things as Chaucer, but I'm very interested in medieval folklore and all kinds of uh, uh, ideas, all kinds of uh, things that medieval folklore has to offer. Uh, unfortunately, our records of the peasantry are not quite as uh, voluminous as our records of the upper classes. Uh, so one thing that folklorists often do is look for uh, folklore a little bit later and see from the present or from recent centuries how far back they can take folklore. What is this? What do you suppose this is? Okay, hat, okay. A Mardi Gras hat? Is it a possibly a Mardi Gras hat? 
Uh, in many places of the world, it's not a Mardi Gras hat, but in uh, uh, southern Louisiana among the Cajuns, this is known as a capuchon. You can see that printed uh, on your screen there. A capuchon, which means hood. Uh, and uh, it is a hat, indeed, uh, that is worn during Mardi Gras by masked revelers who uh, go and make trouble uh, for their neighbors uh, by coming up in disguise and intimidating them and trying to get them to give them chickens. Okay? Uh, we'll see a couple of slides of that later. Uh, but where does this, this thing come from? Uh, uh, why would uh, people these days be wearing uh, such a hat? Uh, and uh, the scholarly consensus about this particular hat uh, is that French folk culture borrowed this hat from the upper classes. You will find in the 14th century and the 15th century that uh, these tall pointed hats were ladies' gear and gear for the nobility to wear uh, during that particular period. Uh, and then the theory goes that this fashion slid down the social scale, uh, going from the higher classes to the lower classes. Uh, and there's a scholarly term for this particular movement, uh, which is uh, the very euphonious term, gesunkenes Kulturgut, okay? uh, which means sunken cultural goods or sunken cultural items. Uh, and it comes from a theory of the classes, uh, perhaps the theory of the classes that has uh, prevailed uh, in academic history, uh, the theory that culture trickles down, uh, that culture uh, is uh, like gravity, uh, that it always moves from the top to the bottom, uh, and that if we look at the lower classes today, we might learn something about how higher classes lived some years earlier. Um, uh, this uh, philosophy goes along with the idea, a certain idea about peasant minds, the idea that uh, peasant mind was a kind of uh, empty barn, uh, just a kind of vacuous place uh, where ideas of smarter, richer, more socially elevated people would inhabit uh, this barn uh, and be pulled out from time to time, a kind of living museum from which we could reconstruct uh, earlier uh, cultures, uh, upper classes. Uh, so it, it was assumed then by scholars that the peasant's mind uh, uh, would uh, preserve uh, the thoughts of many years ago pickle these thoughts, like too much alcohol, perhaps. Uh, and because the peasant didn't have enough imagination to change what he or she received, these items were preserved intact. Okay? Well, there's a certain amount of truth to this. Uh, if we look at uh, these Mardi Gras, and we're going to see some in a minute, uh, we're going to see that, indeed, uh, it's pretty easy for us to trace these Mardi Gras from the Middle Ages uh, to the present day. Uh, but there's also something very inaccurate about the way of things as well. Uh, what is about this idea is that folklore tends to be very conservative in form. Uh, the same shapes and content, sometimes the same words. They just refer to a monkshood, uh, will stay in place for a very long time, over centuries. Uh, and yet, what is inaccurate about this particular looking at things is that as the peasants take on the uh, properties of the upper classes, and as their situation changes over time, they're going to put these old items to completely new uses, uh, so that although we see the same old shapes and the same old content, they're given an entirely new meaning. Because folklore, although very conservative in content and in structure, is very dynamic in meaning, almost infinitely variable in meaning. And any given folk group is going to uh, invest uh, it's uh, received objects, whether they come from uh, the upper classes or not, uh, with all kinds of new meanings. Uh, so I have some slides over here, which I'm going to try to show you, uh, that uh, illustrate how this particular um, Mardi Gras uh, hat uh, is used. Uh, are we getting those slides yet? Apparently not. See something now? OK, let's, let's flip back here. One reason why we can assume that this capuchon has something to do with the way past medieval way of looking at things is that when we look at this Mardi Gras and we see the way that Cajun people practice this Mardi Gras today, we can see other relics from the Middle Ages still in living use today. For example, in the slide that you're viewing now, you'll see one of these capuchons right in the middle. That's worn by most of the Mardi Gras people. And to the right of the picture, you'll see a mortarboard. Okay? Uh, this particular hat was worn in parody of medieval scholars who wore the mortarboard, just as uh, graduates do these days. 
you look at the Mardi Gras at some length, you'll see some other uh, evidence of the early uh, 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 society of the Middle Ages. Uh, people will also wear bishop's mitres. Uh, and it's sort of scary to see a bishop in a mask, you know, pronouncing a benediction like this fellow is in front of us here. Uh, so we can see that these symbols are preserved intact. What uh, I find very interesting is the bishop's hat and the mortar board are still realize, uh, you know, recognized as being a college hat and a bishop's hat. But this capuchon, this very popular capuchon, uh, that is the most popular Mardi Gras hat, uh, is no longer recognized as being a symbol of the French upper classes. It's recognized instead as being the hat of a savage. Uh, in, uh, uh, in, in the uh, Cajun French, people call this hat uh, the capuchon du savage, uh, the savage's hat, or the wild Indian's hat. Uh, and instead of representing authority, this hat has come to represent a kind of attack on authority. So in the slide here, for example, you'll see one of the Mardi Gras breaking into a police car. Uh, this person is no longer using this old hat of nobility, but he's using it for a kind of social statement, a kind of fighting back against the upper classes. And you can see all these uh, sauvage here uh, running down motorists. Instead of being the authorities, again, they're attacking authorities. They break into cars. Uh, uh, they'll uh, often uh, get in cahoots with their capitan. The only person who's not wearing one of these hats, the only person without a mask is the person who's supposed to be controlling uh, them. Uh, but they'll often go up to the capitan and uh, uh, make plans with him uh, to attack various kinds of authority figures. Also, these people really consider themselves to be the social regulators of their community. For example, their specific program, even more than fighting the upper classes, is to preserve their own particular way of life. And this festival of Mardi Gras, as far as they're concerned, is not so much a fight against the upper classes as it is a communal celebration where they go from door to door and beg for chickens. All those chickens go in a gumbo that's fed to the entire community free of charge at the end of the day. Uh, so as they go around town and they get chickens, they thank the, the farmers who gave them chickens. But if they go up to a particular farmhouse where no chickens are given, uh, the old time Mardi Gras would sing, uh, the Mardi Gras wishes that all your chickens die for the next year. And they'll shake their fist uh, at the uh, farmers, as you see these people shaking their fists uh, in a, uh, a shot taken a couple years ago at a Mardi Gras in a small town uh, named Bazile, Louisiana. Um, OK, so the idea here is that we have uh, a symbol that stays around forever, but we find that its meaning is continually changed. Okay, uh, And the fact that this particular symbol came from the upper classes is significant in certain ways. But in other ways, it doesn't make that much different because uh, this particular folk group has given a whole new meaning to this particular uh, symbol and uh, what it does. Um, OK. I want to show a couple other Mardi Gras slides. I think there are about uh, three more to show here that although we can derive this hat from uh, the French middle classes, we also derive it from uh, some other medieval rituals. And these are the rituals that are associated with the 14th century and the years after the plague, the rituals of the penitentes and the rituals of the Inquisition, where you would find individuals dressed up. Am I having trouble with uh, getting the machine to work here? OK. I had simply mentioned that you've also seen these tall conical hats associated with the Inquisition and associated with the penitentes, these people who would rip, whip themselves ritually. And one of the things that happens in Mardi Gras uh, is that there are these capitans, these people without the masks, and they carry whips. Uh, and one of the jobs of the Mardi Gras is to cut up and make as much trouble as it can for their own neighbors, okay? Uh, they'll beg people for money. If they don't get enough money, they'll try to take their shoes away or take off their clothes or do something else uh, to generally disrupt community life. And then they get whipped in return. Uh, well, this, this kind of dynamic uh, between uh, uh, begging and extortion that goes on in the uh, Mardi Gras uh, has to do with crossing the line into sinfulness. It has to do with uh, uh, committing a crime and then doing penance for it. Mardi Gras itself, uh, as you may know, is the day before Lent. Uh, so it's one last big celebration, one big, last big feast you can have before uh, Lent begins. Uh, but it's also right on the cusp then of that penitent time when people punish themselves uh, with austerity uh, in penance uh, uh, in uh, 
um, observance of, of Christ's uh, passion, uh, crucifixion leading up to the resurrection and the celebration of Easter. Uh, so we can find that this Mardi Gras uh, tradition also has its roots in another image from the Middle Ages. And that image has been trans uh, transformed as well over time. Okay? Uh, so I hope that, that I've demonstrated that when the folk pick up something, when the lower classes pick up something uh, from the upper classes or from any other source, uh, it's not simply a matter of mindless repetition, but the symbols which uh, look so uh, similar to us over hundreds of years are constantly being put to new meanings. There's a lot of parody of authority that goes on in the country Mardi Gras among Cajuns right now. And among the parodies that you'll find most dramatic are that uh, now instead of kings and queens, presidents are mocked. So I've seen a uh, Mardi Gras writer dressed up, for example, as Jimmy Carter. Uh, uh, during the days when Jimmy Carter was president. I've seen Mardi Gras dressed up as Ronald Reagan when Ronald Reagan was president. And one Mardi Gras dressed up as Ronald Reagan uh, who rode through the countryside all day long with the lower half of a department store dummy around his neck. So, so he looked like he had the, uh, the sawed off torso of a nude woman uh, that he was wearing as a necklace. Uh, and when you see images like this, uh, you tend to be a little disconcerted. You also tend to see your leaders in a new and sometimes frightening light. There's a lot of social criticism that goes on in Mardi Gras. But in folk culture of the 20th century, just as in folk uh, culture in the 14th century, uh, that uh, a kind of celebration is always of the moment. It's always something that is reflecting what's going on now. So there's something that's very old and something that's very new in folklore. And maybe we should talk for a minute about that combination of old and new that is so uh, important uh, in, uh, in folklore. Um, OK, there are a significant number of historians who are paying increased attention to how the peasantry lived in the Middle Ages. Uh, and prominent among these are some members of a group of uh, Americans who identify themselves with what they call the new history. Are you familiar with the idea of new history and the new historians? Also, in France, uh, there is an older group, very similar to the new historians and its premises, a group of people that identifies itself as the Annalists. Uh, and I'm going to uh, try to write that down for those of you who are not familiar uh, with this particular name. The Annalists were a group of people uh, and continue to be a group of people who try to study uh, culture thoroughly. And a number of them have been very interested in, t uh, in studying culture from the bottom up uh, and very interested in studying uh, what one of the Annalists calls the structures of everyday life. Um, uh, prominent among the uh, Annalise schools is a a French historian who recently died named Fernand Brodel. Uh, and he's very famous for writing a book called Civilization and Capitalism. Uh, and the first volume of this, which runs over 600 pages, is titled The Structures of Everyday Life. Uh, and uh, he speaks uh, toward the end of this first volume of why he spent 600 pages and more talking about the daily life and the pattern existence of the lower classes. OK, uh, these are the people who are on the bottom of the social scale. They are the least studied people of the Middle Ages. But numerically, they're a huge majority. Between 75 and 90% of the population was indeed the peasantry that worked the lands. Okay? Uh, when Bradell finished the first volume of this study, uh, he wrote uh, something uh, like this. He says, I have certainly not devoted myself to history at this particular level for years on end because I regard it as any simpler or clearer. Indeed, sometimes it's harder to study simply because our records are so fragmentary. He also said, nor did I do so because it seemed to have numerical priority, although indeed the peasants did outnumber the nobility uh, throughout the Middle Ages, uh, nor because it had been neglected by the mainstream of history. Nor, though this did carry some weight, because it tied me down to concrete realities at a time when logically, philosophy, social science, and the mathematization uh, were dehumanizing history. No, he returned to this Mother Earth, Brodell says, uh, not only because it was pleasant, but because he did not think it was possible to achieve an understanding of the economic life of the Middle Ages or the post-Middle Ages as a whole if the foundations of the house were not first surveyed. If he didn't look at the world from the bottom up, 
how much would he really know about how that world worked? So it's a very fundamental part of uh, history that we've neglected too long. If we want to see how the Middle Ages worked, we have to look at the whole picture. Uh, well, this Brundell talks about the economy, but folklorists take the same view. Uh, that folk culture, uh, for many people then the lower classes, the unofficial culture, uh, is the foundation upon which all other culture is based. And it's not only the economy, but belief systems, artistry, survival strategies, basic values have as much to do with the peasant way of life as the economy does as well. Uh, folklorists believe that it's impossible to understand these particular aspects of culture without considering uh, the ways in which the vast majority of the population, uh, these relatively powerless people, approached belief, art, values, and survival. So we want to see the whole picture. And if we look at the whole picture and how the peasants live, we perhaps have to take a different perspective on things. And the perspective that uh, was so important to Braudel was the perspective of what he called the long durée, or the long term. Uh, and we have a quote here which describes this kind of pattern of history that was so important to Fernand uh, Rodel. Uh, he says, ever-present, all-pervasive, repetitive, material life is run according to routine. People go on sowing wheat, as they always have done, planting maize, as they always have done. The obstinate presence of the past greedily and steadily swallows up the fragile lifetime of men. They are more past than present at any given time. And this layer of stagnant history is enormous. All rural life belongs to it. How can one understand the towns without understanding the countryside, money without border, the white bread of the rich without the black bread of the poor? Okay. So again, this is his basic logic for what he's doing here. And then if you follow Brodell and you're interested then in history in the long term, you're interesting, uh, interested then in two different kinds of history. And this is a distinction that's made by many of the analyst historians. You have the more familiar history of events, which has been the most common kind of history studied in schools. The event which is taken to be unique and often groundbreaking, the crowning of Charlemagne in the year 800 as Holy Roman Emperor, uh, these big watershed years when important things happened, and they were done by important bishops and kings uh, and, and scholars. Uh, but Brodell says there's another system of time we have to pay attention to, and that's not the event, that's the pattern. This is this daily, daily pattern uh, which runs the world, uh, and that big part of the past which swallows up and determines the present. The making of history, according to many people then, is really the balance between these age-old patterns and these events that sometimes change the patterns, and then the patterns and events work uh, back and forth upon each other, and they make uh, together a certain kind of history that's a little bit different from what we've been studying before, okay? Uh, for some people, uh, like the French scholar Jacques Le Goff, uh, in an essay which he uh, titled The Historian and the Ordinary Man, in a book called Time, Work, and Culture in the Middle Ages, the ideal is to have a history without events. Okay, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that we should study only the pattern. Uh, I'm thinking uh, that more and more of the Annalise historians are coming to the conclusion that we have to look at both and look at the way that they balance each other out. Again, the idea here is to look at the whole picture. And my job as a folklorist is to represent particularly that part of the world, uh, that huge part of the medieval world that's been underrepresented in the past, but which is becoming more and more uh, to represent uh, for uh, contemporary historians a major part uh, a major missing piece of the puzzle of uh, how medieval culture worked. Um, okay, and when we consider uh, different uh, ways about uh, how medieval uh, culture might work, it might be most important uh, to consider uh, some ideas uh, having to do uh, with the early history of the Middle Ages and how this peasantry, which uh, formerly was not Christian and lived in uh, tribal groups, uh, some small farming groups and some migratory groups as well, how this peasant culture, which had a long-lasting uh, history before it became part of the Christian church and before the Middle Ages started flowering, uh, uh, how it conducted itself and how its concerns and daily patterns were worked into uh, the uh, uh, daily uh, patterns of the church and into the history of events of the upper classes. Um, and one of the most important uh, watershed uh, times to consider 
uh, comes from very early on uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, around the year 600, when the Pope Gregory the Great uh, sent a letter to an English missionary, Miletus. Okay? Uh, at this time, there had been Celtic peoples living in Britain, and they were followed uh, largely uh, by Anglo-Saxon peoples. Uh, some of the Celtic people had been Christianized as early as the fourth century, uh, when they were subjects of the Roman Empire. But by and large, England was run by a group of uh, uh, non-Christian, pagan, Anglo-Saxons. Uh, and therefore, around the year 600, a mission was sent by the Pope uh, to uh, try to Christianize these people. Gregory the Great had a particular program of Christianization, uh, which I think is very important to pay attention to. Okay? Uh, and his uh, words uh, in a letter he sent uh, to the missionary Miletus uh, go like this. Uh, let the shrine of idols by no means be destroyed, but let the idols which are in them be destroyed. Then Gregory goes on to say, convert uh, these old pagan temples into new churches, okay, uh, which uh, have a Christian message. He goes on to say, let water be consecrated and sprinkled in these same temples so that the people, not seeing their own temples destroyed, uh, may displace error from their hearts and recognize and adore the true God, meeting in the familiar way at the accustomed places. Okay? Familiar and accustomed. I think those are important words. Gregory right here recognizes the fact uh, that people live according to patterns, and you can't convert people by just simply disassembling their age-old patterns. You have to deal in some ways with people if you want to convince them in a compromising fashion. Okay? And what we find happening uh, throughout the early Middle Ages uh, in Europe is a combination of older pagan systems of looking at the world and living in the world with this new Christian ideology. Okay? Uh, and uh, the coming together of these two cultures, the older one and the newer one, uh, is an example of what anthropologists and folklorists called syncretism. If uh, you want to look at the, uh, the sheet there, uh, which is the blending of two or more traditions to create a new or unique tradition. Um, when we think of the major dates that were part of the peasants' year and that are still to this day part of the liturgical Christian year, uh, we're thinking of a whole pattern of life that was worked out, not just merely as a church calendar, but as part of a larger system of how nature, society, and the supernatural were seen to work together. So syncretism, uh, as it happened in the British Isles, involved the trick okay, of getting nature, society, and the supernatural, these three different ways of looking at the world, to work in sync. Now, Gregory the Great comes along with a whole new supernatural or religious system, uh, which he wants to use to change the minds and the hearts and the souls of the pagan people who are living in England. Uh, at the same time, he knows that this society is already a society that lives in a kind of synchronicity uh, with its natural environments, okay? That nature and society are living in close correspondence. Uh, he, if he's changing the supernatural system, he's changing in some ways the, the tip of the iceberg. He has to somehow, you know, uh, introduce uh, a religious system that makes sense in terms of the pre-existing natural and social systems. When we talk about the peasantry in England, um, and when we uh, uh, consider uh, how difficult it was for people to live in these days, we can assume quite easily that as much as 90% of the population, or sometimes more, was in pretty regular danger of starvation due to crop shortages, uh, due to famines, due to warfare, and the burning of fields, and all kinds of other disasters. Uh, if we want to get some idea of how these uh, early people uh, lived, we might consider, first of all, uh, the houses that they had and the basic uh, house structure that you'll find in Anglo-Saxon times. And this has probably been uh, covered in another lecture you've had. Is a longhouse, the Anglo-Saxon longhouse, uh, which you still find uh, as a peasant household in northern England and Scotland, other regions in England today, generally about 10 feet by 50 feet. Okay, uh, often divided in the middle now, seldom in older days apparently by a wall, but sometimes by a dresser or something. 
And on one side of the house, you would have the family living. On the other side, you would have your animals. Uh, why don't we have these animals living with the people in these, these houses, of, uh, uh, such small houses? Okay. Anybody have any idea? It's a heat source. It's a heat source, OK. Uh, good, OK. Even into the 18th, 19th, early 20th century, people would live with animals to keep warm. Uh, through the winter. This is particularly true in areas like Scotland or the, uh, uh, the moors in England where you don't have a lot of wood for fires and where peat might be in short supply. People need the body heat of their animals to keep their uh, daily existence uh, at an optimal condition. Uh, in many of these houses as they survived into the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries, and as we assume they were constructed in earlier years as well, we find that the roofs are made of thatch. OK, this is the straw, uh, the, the grain without the head that is saved from the harvest and then sort of sewn up and uh, turned into a roof. Now, what we find uh, in some of these houses as well is that there is no chimney in these houses. And they have a fire in the middle of the house. We assume uh, that in the old days, as now, smoke will fill up the house pretty much all the way uh, in the, the upper part of the house, and maybe only two or three feet above the ground, are you able to uh, sit down and, and, and talk and enjoy yourself without choking, OK? Uh, why would people make a house where they were smoking themselves almost out of existence, where they, they'd ha have to lie down through the nights as the fire was burning? Why would they do that? To conserve heat is, is one of the possibilities here. But the other possibility, and the other certainty, at least uh, from the, uh, what we know now from the way that uh, the peasants have lived uh, in, recorded, in, in better recorded history, is that they needed the carbon from the fires in order to make their crops grow. The soil is so, so poor in parts of uh, England and Scotland and Wales uh, that you have to save your smoke. Uh, the smoke that attaches to the straw okay, is saved. And at the end of the winter, that thatching is torn down. Okay, and a new roof is put up. Okay, uh, and the thatching that's torn down is spread over the fields as fertilizer to help the crops grow. Okay. In a world that is structured this way, where the difference between life and death is so narrow, and where people live in constant need, uh, in constant interdependence with their animals, indeed live with their animals through the winter. Uh, this idea that nature and society depend upon each other is no abstract idea. It's a daily fact of life. Okay? Uh, so then we might assume that they would structure their festivals uh, to punctuate the rhythms of their work uh, at those times when work was done or at certain times when they had to change gears in their work and get people together uh, get involved in some sort of social solidarity okay, that would help everybody make it through the winter. Okay. As, you might uh, as you might imagine, a lot of this um, uh, festive uh, interaction would have to do with invoking the supernatural as well. Uh, because when uh, your level of subsistence uh, is uh, so uh, narrow, where your chances for survival really depend on all your resources, then you're going to be invoking the supernatural, the magical, and the divine to help you out one way or another. Uh, what is this thing? I'm going to try to put this thing on the monitor here and hope you see it better there. Can you all see that uh, on the monitor? Uh, OK. Any of you have ever seen anything quite like that before? OK. Uh, this is what is called a corn dolly. OK. Uh, and this particular design is quite often found in Yorkshire in the north of England. It's associated with Celtic culture, but it's also uh, associated with lots of cultures uh, throughout Europe. Uh, quite often, uh, this is made of the last bits of straw and wheat and so forth and so on from the uh, last harvest, okay? uh, from the harvest of the year before. Uh, and then on a very special day, which is usually St. Bridget's Day or Candlemas Day, uh, February 1st or 2nd, okay? The corn dolly, which is made from the, the successful pro crops of the last year, is taken out into the fields. Uh, and just as the plowing is going forward, this corn dolly is put into the fields. Okay, Why is it put out there? What's the reason for that? 
okay, to make the crops grow, to make the crops grow, to ensure a good harvest, okay? There's a principle here which folklorists call contagious magic, uh, the idea that the part never leaves the whole. If this was the, the, a successful harvest, if these are the last fruits of the successful harvest, if we put them back in the field, then the life force of that harvest is going to continue and it's going to live into the next year as well. So a lot of the supernatural beliefs of the early peasantry, some of which survive into these days, have to do with using the supernatural as a kind of glue, a kind of glue to make sure that nature and society were in sync. Okay? Uh, and there is a whole peasant year then that is based on the idea of using the supernatural to get the most out of nature through certain kinds of social rituals. Uh -huh. This is a very pagan kind <clears throat> of custom. Um, did this continue through when, when these different areas were very Christianized? I mean, because Candlemas Day, for example, uh -huh. is a pagan day. Mm -hmm. It's not really, I mean, the Christians brought it in, but it, it was originally pagan. How did this come into when Christianity was introduced? OK, I, there, there are many answers to that. Uh, so many of these pagan holidays were similar to Christianity because the Christians knowingly adapted the symbols of the pagan religion and tried to convert them to a different use. If we go back to this idea of syncretism and Gregory the Great where he says, keep their festivals in these particular times. He says at one point, let them slaughter their animals for their harvest festivals, uh, but no longer have them sacrifice to devils. Now let them eat together in thanksgiving for the benefits that they have gotten from the Christian God, okay? What Gregory the Great then is doing is he's preserving this cycle of nature, society, and supernatural. He's trying to change the supernatural a little bit, but even the supernatural is most often changed with references to pagan symbolism. Where, for example, did the uh, idea of having fire at Candlemas come from? You know, Candlemas uh, is a celebration of the purification of the Virgin Mary after the birth of Christ. After 40 days of ritual isolation, she has reinducted into the church. But the candle mass ritual, as long as we have it, is a ritual that apparently took place at night and people had these lit candles, hence the name candle at mass. They celebrated at night Mary's reincorporation into society. Uh, after giving birth to Jesus, okay? Uh, the light itself, this fire, what is the significance of this? Well, we might take this back a little bit and consider what is the significance of fire at Christmas time. Another time when we know that we have candles burning through the night, all of our early mentions of Christmas, uh, mentions, for example, of 12th century London uh, by William uh, Fitzstevens, uh, tell us uh, that uh, there is greenery in every house, just as there is now. And we're told from other sources that there are fires that are going through the night uh, on Christmas time. Uh, what is the significance of having this fire and light uh, at uh, the candle mass, but also 40 days earlier at Christmas? Um, it could be partly the sun cycle. You know, Christmas is really close to the shortest day of the year, and at candle mass time, the late days are lengthening, and there's a noticeable difference. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so the, the, the significance that the sun, of the sun cycle here. Uh, indeed, this seems to be the reason why uh, we celebrate Christmas on December 25th. Uh, this uh, is established, according to most authorities, in the 4th century, around the year 325 at the Nicene Council. Okay? At that time, there is almost no pre-existing tradition that says that Christ was born on December 25th. Indeed, there are arguments that he was born at the other time, uh, at some other time of the year. Uh, but uh, December 25th was indeed the date of the solstice in the calendar of the time, and it was also uh, the, uh, the date of a particular uh, pre-Christian celebration of the Roman peoples called the birthday of the unconquered sun. That is S-U-N, not S-O-N. This is the sun. And the whole idea here is that the darkest hour is just before dawn, after the uh, sun has uh, declined more and more in the sky, the days have gotten shorter and shorter, the nights have gotten longer and longer and more frightening. Uh, then, all of a sudden, the days begin to lengthen, and then this is the birthday of the unconquered 
sun. The sun is back, okay? There's an idea then that life is returning to the world. And this is an idea that is important for any group of people, particularly people in, in Northern Europe who are living by the cycle of the seasons. They want a return of greenery, and hence the greenery in the houses. They want a return of sun and warmth and light, and hence the fires that burn through the night. Uh, and there is a natural symbolism here of death and rebirth, okay? Now say the Christians come along and they have a particular creed and a belief system that states uh, that uh, they uh, have a God who is killed and reborn, and his rebirth means the, the re... He's killed and resurrected, rather, and his resurrection means the rebirth of the souls of everyone. It means a rebirth into eternal life, okay? Then haven't they found the perfect natural symbol, okay, to explain their theology to the vast majority of people who live according to these rhythms of the year? And if they've done so, uh, so then, they have a, a system there that syncretizes uh, the pagan beliefs with the Christian beliefs that respects the natural cycle and the social cycle of work that's based on the natural cycle uh, in a supernatural system that still maintains a lot of the older traditions. So though we can pretty safely say that fire and greenery were around before Christianity, we can also fairly safely say that they're very good symbols to be used for the Christian message. So syncretism works best when you have a plan uh, that allows both of the previous traditions to get as much as possible out and, and to meld together as easily as possible. So the people who would say go out into the fields into the 19th and even the 20th century and leave these corn dollies there did not consider themselves to be pagans. They considered themselves to be good Christians. And this is what good Christians do. Uh, part of the message of death and rebirth uh, can be seen uh, in this uh, particular symbolism as well. Uh, the, the, the world will die, but it will be born again. Uh, and as Christians, they believe their souls would do the same. So for them, there wasn't necessarily any clash between the old pagan ways of looking at things and the new Christian way of looking at things. Okay. Um, if we look at the year of the peasants, and this is something that you'll find in uh, your book of readings for this course, uh, you'll see a very uh, complicated rhythm of life uh, that changed a little bit from culture to culture. Uh, and on the sheet that you're now looking at, which I'm going to have to scan up and down as, as we uh, look at this um, uh, in some detail, um, uh, you'll see uh, three different years uh, and year systems that were very important uh, in um, uh, uh, England at various times. You have the old Anglo-Saxon calendar, which represented the pagan peoples uh, who were there in the 6th century. Uh, then you have the Celtic calendar, which I put in the middle there, which exists uh, as, uh, and represents an even older uh, stratum of, uh, of society in Great Britain. And then finally on the right there you see the Christian calendar, which comes along and which is in many ways a response to and a syncretism with uh, the older calendars uh, that we find. Uh, for example, uh, where does Halloween come from? Where, where does Halloween come from? I'm not sure I have my holidays right, but is it the Beltane Festival? No, that's different, okay. Halloween is the day before the first day of the new year, Samhain. Okay, Samhain. And you will see in the middle column there that this was the new year in the Celtic calendar. The year begins on November 1st, which is Samhain. Uh, which is also, uh, I believe, pronounced among the, the Scots Gaelic. Uh, you're using a, uh, a, uh, an Irish pronunciation. Among the Scots Gaelic is Samhain, or Samhain. Uh, and uh, it was then a date which was very important in the old system. Okay? Now, what was important about this particular date? Uh, let's consider uh, the uh, cycle of the year as a kind of cosmic clock, a great circle of the seasons. Uh, and Samhain, falling around November 1st, or around our 11 o'clock, okay, uh, was the end of the harvest period. Uh, it was also uh, the time when society would be reunited. If you look at Highland Scotland, you look in the west of Wales, you look at parts of Ireland and parts of England as well, you'll find these people who are living a very subsistence life in small valleys. And as they live in these small valleys, 
uh, they recognize that they're going to live on the hillsides largely because they need every inch uh, of cultivatable land that they can get. Uh, and if they put all these inches together in their little valley, they still have barely enough uh, to support themselves and their livestock. Well, they need the livestock as well. What are they going to do with those animals? Uh, uh, they can keep these animals through the winter when the, the crops aren't growing. But around May 1st, which is the May Day, another old one, the ancient Celtic celebration of Beltana uh, or Beltane. Well, sorry about that. Um, they have to send some of the people away from uh, the village. And usually, this was the men, although in some cases in Scotland, it seems to be the women who were separated from the rest of the group uh, and went out then into further pastures in order to find greenery for their cattle to eat and fatten the cattle up for the coming year because they need both their cattle and their crops to get along. So through the year, we have men and women, boys and girls together, uh, living together. We have their livestock with them, keeping them warm through the winter and eating the stubble from the harvest of the year before. But around May the 1st, okay, uh, we have these fires of Belton, and we drive the cattle by the fires, this idea of fire generating heat and warmth again. Uh, and this is supposed to make the cattle fertile. We also have a celebration here which, uh, of uh, people uh, being perhaps fertile as well because a lot of courtship goes on on May Day, as it does into the, uh, the present day. We find a lot of people pairing off uh, and perhaps some licentious activity taking place out in the fields because, after all, the young men and the young women are going to be separated for a full half year as one group then goes out to take care of the cattle. So we have half of the population left behind and working the fields next to the village. The other half is out there in the sheelings, out there in the countryside, uh, taking care of, of the crops, I mean, taking care of the cattle and the sheep and the other livestock. Uh, and then finally, when the harvest comes in in September, okay, and then in October as well, we have some more harvesting done. Around November 1st, we uh, drive all the cattle back into the, uh, uh, the home fields, and the cattle begin to eat the stubble. All these people then are reunited. We have a homecoming of the crops to the barn, of the cattle to the home field, of the women to the men. So we see nature and society reunited during this particular time. Uh, and this is one particularly special time where it's important to invoke the spirits of the past. It was believed by the ancient Celts that the spirits of the dead, particularly those who had died the year before, would be accessible to the living, and that the living could call on the spirits of the dead to help them. And to help them to do what? What is most important for them? To make it through the year. How do you make it through the year? You rely on your natural resources, and especially now after half a year of separation, you rely on your social resources, and you have to ensure that everybody is in it together. So what do you do? You have a number of festivals. First thing you do is count up your livestock. You see how many of them you can keep alive through the winter. The rest of them you kill, and you have these huge ritual feasts where everybody gets together and eats the food in kind of celebration of their, their bonding with each other. Their uh, need for food is quite obvious, and here they're all celebrating their interdependence as well. And then. In the evening, you have these kind of courtship rituals as well that revolve, uh, that revolve around a kind of symbolism that makes a connection between the natural, the social, and the supernatural world. Now, we don't have these uh, festival uh, beliefs and rituals documented from the Middle Ages. The knowledge of what goes on with the peasants uh, is not very good then. Most of our knowledge comes from the 15th century and later, and the rituals that I'm about to describe right now actually come from the 17th and 18th century. But they give you some idea of a kind of connection which we can find evidence of in the Middle Ages and we'll be talking about in a few minutes. Um, for example, in Robert Burns' Halloween, a very famous poem by a very famous poet, he uh, examines a co the kinds of rituals that he performed as a young boy uh, in Ayrshire, in Scotland, as part of his Halloween observances. Again, courtship was very important. The young boys, the young girls would get together. Uh, people would sit around a fire, and then the young woman or the young man would pick two nuts, okay, and she would throw these nuts into the fire. Uh, and as she did so, she would name herself and her prospective boyfriend and give names to these nuts, okay? Uh, and then 
uh, what happened to these nuts in the fire would dictate what happened to their courtship. Okay? If they jumped apart from each other, no go. You better look for another boyfriend, right? But if they fuse together in flame, in loving flame, and they just uh, sort of popped uh, together, then it looked like things were going to go pretty well uh, in the ensuing year or perhaps even that night as well. Well, look at the kind of symbolism that's involved there. You have a social ritual. Someone's looking for a mate. Uh, and then you have natural objects, these nuts, these fruits of the harvest that you use to symbolize the girl and the boy. And then what happens to them is going to happen to the human couple. There's a supernatural and magical belief there. It's a magical belief which uh, folklorists identify as homeopathic magic. The idea that like affects like. Okay. If you do one thing with two similar objects, it's going to uh, influence these two other similar uh, objects. If you've named these nuts as people, uh, then uh, uh, these people are going to be like the nuts. They're going to act the same way. Okay. Uh, so there you see all three of those components, the nature, the society, and the supernatural all working together. Um, OK, we can assume that uh, the practice of Samhain, of uh, ritual, was similar to what Robert Burns tells us. We have all kinds of records from ancient Ireland that let us know that this was a time when supernatural uh, beings were supposed to walk the earth. It was a celebration of the harvest and involved vegetable symbolism and social interaction, mating among those different interactions. So we can be relatively sure that something like what we're talking about existed uh, uh, at these times. Okay, the Christians come in uh, and they realize that this festival is just too important to throw away. It has to do with everything. It has to do with all your crops, all your livestock, and all your future as a society. You don't toss it away. So the Christians then come in and they try to figure out some way to celebrate this festival that is going to uh, accord as well as possible with the earlier pagan meaning. Uh, so in the 8th century then, uh, the Christian church sets up Halloween as the eve of All Saints Day, correct? And All Saints Day is supposed to be a celebration of the saints or the dead heroes of the Christian church. And here, Okay, we assume that people are still going to do their natural and social rituals, okay? But now we're assuming that instead of invoking these dead uh, ancestors or these spirits, they're going to be praying to the saints, okay? Now, one little problem exists here, and that is that in most of these rituals, as we can document them, the supernatural presences we're not supposed to come from far away and long ago necessarily, but these were supposed to be people from the community who died in the previous year, people who were known, part of a community. So at the same time that you have a homecoming of the crops to the barn and the girls to the boys, you have a harvest of souls. And the souls come home, and you commune with the souls as well. This is a community recognition of, of, uh, of your dead ancestors and your dead relatives. Uh, could that maybe be why there are so many um tons of little-known saints in England, did they sort of turn their new, newly departed into local saints? Um, it's not exactly. In certain cases, there may be family figures who became saints, but the local is important. You know, the idea that, that this particular saint that you're praying to is a saint who knows your fields and knows your family, knows your community, and knows your church is part, I think, of this system we're talking about. Um, but what is very important in this particular uh, situation right here is that the community is still being left out as far as the church is concerned. The church has tried to create a syncretism between the pagan way and the Christian way, and they've got these heroes from long ago and far away. It's true that you can have some help by getting local saints to bring the saints closer to the community, but what about those family members? That's a problem. The church realized that people were still celebrating All Saints Day as a time to go and remember their own dead, okay? So finally, in the 10th century, they had to institute a new holiday. November 2nd became All Souls Day, and this was a celebration of all the dead. And the family nature then of this two-day period uh, could be uh, emphasized. Uh, and it's interesting how long, how pervasive uh, this tradition of uh, uh, th this tradition of, um, 
of paying attention to your local dead has been. Any of you familiar, uh, for example, with the Days of the Dead in Mexico these days? What happens uh, during November 1st and 2nd in Mexico? Uh, or among the Cajuns whom I've done field work with on Toussaint or November 1st. The Cajuns on November 1st go out to their local cemeteries. Even though it's All Saints Day, they're practicing All Souls Day. They whitewash these cemeteries. They put flowers in there and they spend the day with their own dead. Okay? In Mexico, it's even more like the, the way things may have been in the Middle Ages, as we, as we speculate, in that uh, they have the Days of the Dead on November 1st and November 2nd, and the whole family, the whole community indeed goes to the cemetery. They're out there all night. They've got their candles burning because this is the beginning of the winter season. And again, we're putting that light uh, out there to sort of help the growth principle along. Uh, and they will eat meals with their dead. They'll leave some food for the dead. Uh, they'll have some other food themselves. Uh, some uh, uh, times in some communities there will be a grave that's abandoned because that family's all died out or moved away. And people then will sort of adopt that dead person without any uh, uh, living relatives uh, nearby as a sort of uh, uh, Tio Jose, you know, Uncle Jose or so forth, the unknown soldier, the unknown dead, and they all go over there, spend some time with this dead person, so this dead person won't be lonely. It's a very, very impressive picture of community solidarity in, in, in a concept of the community that goes beyond just the group here, but extends all the way back into the memory and sometimes beyond the memory of people to incorporate all their dead with the living. Okay? This has been so important that the folk won this interaction. They still celebrate their families on All Saints Day, even though that's never been the official Christian position. Uh, and this is why I say that folk culture, even if it's not uh, present in the name of the celebration, such as All Saints, even if it's not the official way of celebrating things, the folk culture, this unofficial, family-oriented community uh, way of looking at things, can influence people for centuries, millennia, uh, in powerful ways, and sometimes more powerful than anything that we find uh, in elite culture. Now, if we go into the Middle Ages, it's true that we can't find out that much about these celebrations. Um, in um, um, uh, every case. Uh, but we do know a lot about noble celebrations, uh, noble celebrations having to do with the natural and the social, and sometimes with the supernatural. And I think it's reasonable for us to assume that these noble celebrations are in some ways imitations and recastings of these kinds of, uh, of, of peasant or countryside rituals we were talking about. Uh, for example, in England in the 15th century, we know there was the tradition of the holly and the ivy, where you would have a group of people who would get together, a uh, group of, uh, of women who would identify themselves as ivy, a group of men who would identify themselves as holly, and these people then play vegetables. And they start singing, they start caroling and doing dances, where the women say, ivy's better than holly, and the men say, holly's better than ivy. Uh, but in the end, uh, uh, in many of these dances, uh, the ivy wraps around the holly, and this is in some ways symbolic, I think, of the coming together, even the sexual coming together of, of females and males. And again, we have the idea of a kind of vegetable love here. We have the idea that people are like vegetables. We have the idea that nature and society work together. Uh, and perhaps we don't see any more the supernatural glue holding the two together, but in some of the celebrations we still see this. Uh, for example, we know in York in the 15th century, that mistletoe, and I believe holly as well, I'm not quite sure about this, uh, mistletoe and I believe holly were put on the altar at the Minster of York, this great church in the middle of York, uh, as a sign of peace. Okay. Uh, we have a poem from the Middle Ages called Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, where there's a green knight who rides into a King Arthur's court uh, during the New Year celebration, and he bears holly in his hand, as a sign of peace, okay? So this idea that this holly represents life, represents peace, represents part of perhaps a Christian message as well as a natural message of rebirth is wrapped up in some of these celebrations of the Middle Ages. Uh, we know from Chaucer's time in the 14th century, during May Day, uh, uh, during May 1st, in the celebration of Beltana, okay, uh, the halfway point in the year when men and women uh, have their sort of last fling before they go off to work, okay, uh, that uh, apparently people uh, dressed up 
as flowers and leaves or identify themselves either with the flower or the leaf. Uh, and again, they played amorous games around the time of May Day, uh, associating themselves with flowers. Uh, and I think we can see these, these noble celebrations again as reflections of these, these sort of uh, age-old uh, concerns of uh, peasant society. Okay, you have any questions on this cycle of the year? Okay, one point I'd like to make about it is that for the peasants particularly, uh, the, the people who play together also pray together. Uh, these festivals were important uh, as religious holidays for the official church, but they were also just about the only time that the peasants had off. Uh, so if you were to have a religious celebration that involves invoking a saint, but also a lot of courtship, perhaps a lot of drinking, uh, perhaps a little sexual license, uh, these two things did go together simply because holy days and holidays are the same word, right? They have the same root. Uh, and for the peasants then, uh, these two things uh, went together in, in a, a very important way, in a way that I think the upper classes uh, picked up on as well. Uh, but the upper classes tend to segregate their pious activity from their playful activity a little bit more, because after all, the, the upper classes had a little bit more time off. Uh, when you look at the official upper class ways of celebrating these particular holidays, you'll see that sometimes, uh, as in the case of the hat, the capuchon that we mentioned at the beginning of this period, uh, the flow of culture does go from the upper classes to the lower classes. But nevertheless, when the lower classes get a hold of these celebrations, uh, things change significantly. Uh, for example, we know that Christmas time was a very important time, not only, you know, of course, as the celebration of the birth of Christ, but also because it was the, the longest time off that peasants had. The peasants generally had 12 days to 14 days, 12 days to two weeks off right after Christmas. And the whole idea of our 12 days of Christmas, which is still celebrated in, in Christmas carols, uh, is related to this idea that this was the longest vacation of the year for the, Christi uh, for, uh, for the Christian peasants. Uh, so generally, the 12 days of Christmas would run from, Janu uh, from December 25th, Christmas time. Um, and then onward, if you look at the, the bottom of that sheet uh, that we've been looking at here, and then onward, uh, through January 1st, which was the Feast of Circumcision, the Circumcision of Christ, and also the Feast of Fools, and then on to January 6th, or Epiphany, uh, which was uh, usually the end of the 12 days of Christmas. Okay? Very, very special time uh, for the celebrations of all Christians. But also, interestingly enough, a time when the lower classes got to take over a lot of these celebrations, and especially on January 1st in some places, although it varied. Uh, from place to place, you had the Festival of Fools, where in a local community, somebody but might be named the Priest of Fools, uh, or in a big church where there is a bishop, somebody might be named Bishop of Fools, or Archbishop of Fools, or even Pope of Fools, if we're at a church that owes direct allegiance to the Vatican. Okay? And here we see, again, the folk using the symbols of the upper classes and the elite, but giving these symbols new meaning, and in this case, a sort of parody meaning. Uh, for example, the Pope of Fools would wear the breeches of the bishop, uh, but he wear them on his head. Okay? They would be burning things in the censers where incense is normally burned, but it would often be dung instead of incense that's burned in the censers. Okay? Uh, then the Pope of Fools or the Bishop of Fools would come to the lectern and deliver uh, a sermon, and we have a couple surviving sermons uh, from the Festival of Fools. One of these is called the Prose of the Ass, and it celebrates the donkey, okay, that carried uh, Joseph and Mary and Jesus out of Bethlehem and into Egypt on their flight when Herod was looking for them, okay? Uh, and uh, some of the words to this uh, Prose of the Ass goes something like this. Behold the ass, the ma magnificent, beautiful ass at which point the congregation all brays in response. Hee-haw, hee-haw. Uh, notice how his magnificent jaw pulverizes the fodder. Hee-haw, hee-haw. See his beautiful collar. Hee-haw, hee-haw. The fruit in the shaft he separates on the thrashing room floor. Hee-haw, hee-haw. 
Okay, then we, you go on through this parody mass, and then people run out into the streets and sing these wild licentious songs. These people consider themselves to be religious, okay? A number of the church functionaries get into the game as well, a number of the lower people in the church. Some of the people at the top of the church consider all this to be blasphemous. But there is a mixture of playing and praying that's going on here. The mockery, as far as the lower classes are concerned, is a mockery of the pretentiousness of the officials, right? They're, they're not mocking necessarily their Christian religion. What they're mocking is uh, the upper classes. And during a very few days of the year, they have a chance to get away with this sort of thing. Uh, so you'll see festivals going both ways. Some of these uh, ancient festivals of the countryside that are based on the rhythms of life have their reflexes, even in the cities. And some of these uh, Christian celebrations that come from the top down get transformed by the folk and have a certain kind of vivid life to them. Interestingly enough, we know the bad festivals better than the good festivals, okay? The bad festivals being those that the upper classes didn't like, that the clerics didn't like. Uh, in these long complaints about the ways that the peasants lived and the way the lower classes were really sort of subhuman, okay, uh, they would mention these festivals. So we have this great documentation of, uh, of some of these, uh, these kind of uh, spotty uh, festivals here. Okay. Um, as you can see from looking at the chart that I passed out to you, these particular holidays are just there to punctuate a very long period of work. And it's still mainly the work uh, that's the uh, uh, important thing for these peasants. Uh, that's what they have to get done. They have really only... Uh, three sizable uh, periods of vacation. The longest one uh, is that two-week period around Christmas, and that is the special time for, uh, uh, for the peasants. Uh, but there is also the time around Easter, uh, and there's one week then that the peasants have off at Easter, and that's Holy Week. Again, this is the time when uh, there's supposed to be penance and abstinence and uh, self-torture uh, and uh, not a lot of celebrating. And indeed, from the traditions that have survived, it seemed that the peasants did go through a certain kind of abstinence, uh, the way people still give up things at Lent. Uh, but Easter was followed by a celebration known as Hocking Day, uh, which has continued in England and elsewhere. Uh, and this was also a day off. It was the day after Easter. Uh, and in, uh, on Hawking Day, apparently, it was sort of like Sadie Hawkins Day, where the women went after the men. The, the women would pursue the men, uh, try to uh, uh, get them to get involved in courtship games. Apparently, in certain cases, put them in some sort of prison. And then the men would have to buy their way out by kissing. Uh, the women who wanted them to surrender to them, all this sort of thing. So we have kissing days, days of courtship, uh, days of pursuit to end this Easter celebration. Okay? Uh, looking forward on the chart, uh, you'll also see that there was one week's uh, vacation uh, uh, in uh, May or June around Whitsun Day uh, or uh, the uh, Feast of the Pentecost, 50 days after Easter. So it would vary according to the calendar with the date of Easter. Uh, and at this particular time, you'd have one week's vacation as well. Uh, and this would be your last big fling then before the really hard backbreaking work of the harvest would start uh, and uh, the cycle of work would uh, um, begin all over again. Okay. Any questions or comments on any of this right now? So, so we can recover uh, just then a little bit of the peasant celebration. Uh, but enough uh, to indicate to us that it was very important. Uh, in England at this time, uh, London, even in the 14th century, probably did not have more than 40,000 people, and some historians will tell you 30,000 people. Uh, nevertheless, you have close to, to 2 million people in all of England. So the great majority of people lived uh, out in the country, and their life uh, styles did indeed uh, dictate uh, the rhythm of, uh, of uh, daily life. <clears throat> okay, I, um, at, at this particular point, um, I'd like to ask, you know, beyond what kind of workers we have, what sort of people the peasants were? What sort of images we get of the peasants? And what, what we might learn from these particular images. Uh, if you look at a lot of stained glass or a lot of uh, the cathedrals, you don't see too many peasants. 
however, there are certain kinds of peasants that always show up in the uh, imagery. For example, Adam uh, is always depicted uh, as somebody who is delving the earth, someone who's digging the earth uh, to become uh, a, uh, to be a farmer. Uh, and you will also usually see in the holy windows the depiction of the sower of seeds. Okay? Uh, so these images of rural life are found. Uh, at Lincoln Cathedral, there's an amazing figure of a peasant which is on top of one of the highest spires of the cathedral. Okay? And it shows a shepherd who is walking with a huge boulder on his shoulder. And this figure is known as the Shepherd of We. Unfortunately, I don't have a, a picture of this Shepherd of We. Okay? But he's celebrating, he's elevated so high to commemorate all those peasants who did all this sort of voluntary work, uh, to uh, voluntary work perhaps, to move all those stones to make sure that the cathedral itself was built, and did the backbreaking work indeed on which the cathedral was made. But then it, there are certain places you can look in a cathedral where the peasants really seem to prevail. Uh, for example, you might see an image like the image of this particular peasant. This is a carving, a wooden carving of a sort of stealthy looking, creepy looking kind of peasant uh, that's found uh, as a roof boss of the monks' cloisters uh, in Lincoln Cathedral. Uh, and sometimes in this very low elevation, made out of wood instead of out of stone, you'll find some images of peasants in their daily life. If you look even further, uh, and you look under the chairs where the bishop would sit, okay, you'll find other images of the peasants. And sometimes these peasants will be doing things uh, like uh, uh, carrying weapons. Uh, sometimes we'll see women in, uh, peasant women beating up peasant men. Sometimes we'll see geese attacking foxes and rabbits attacking dogs. This is a kind of symbolism of the world turned upside down, where the little guy gets even with the big guy. Is this some sort of subversive message, uh, perhaps, where the peasants are letting their own view of the world or the way they wish the world would work emerge? Uh, these very interesting uh, images, which unfortunately I have no more of to show you uh, because of copyright considerations, are found mostly on the bottom of what are called misericords. Okay? Uh, this is a Latin word meaning mercy. Okay? Uh, and the misericord is what was known as the mercy seat. Okay, in uh, English cathedrals and other European cathedrals at this time, as in modern movie theaters, you would have seats that could turn up. Okay, now there are certain very long parts of the Catholic service during which a person is supposed to stand up all through. Okay, and there were very many doddering old bishops who were not really very well off physically because they didn't work all their lives the way the peasants did, okay? And these figures sometimes would need help in standing up. So as you moved up the top of the seat, there would be a kind of lip on the seat where a bishop could sort of unobtrusively look like he was standing up, but he'd actually be sort of half sitting down on that bump, okay? And that was known as the misericord or the mercy seat, okay? This very place where the bishops separated uh, or situated their butts, okay, was the very place where you would find these carved images of the geese chasing the fox, okay? Or the rabbits chasing the hunters, or the rabbits chasing the dogs, or the women beating up the men, or the peasants looking very strong and brutish, okay? We know from Flanders, not from England, but from Flanders in the 14th century, that uh, the workmen, they were mainly workmen who carved these seats, were given carte blanche. They were able to determine themselves what the symbolism would be. So it's interesting. If you look closely enough and you look low enough in the church, you will see that the lower class, again, is making its mark on culture, that it's leaving its foundational view of culture there. And it's one that, not surprisingly, at least in its wishes, at least in these fantasy creations, um, is uh, passing on the image of a world where the little guy has a certain amount of power. Uh, so often this message of, of peasant life is embedded uh, just uh, uh, inconspicuously in the overall fabric, say, of a cathedral or of a stained glass window. But nevertheless, you will see it. 
And I think it's one of the important things that uh, uh, can come out of a close examination and a holistic uh, examination of a medieval uh, cathedral. Okay. Let's see further uh, questions or comments on this. Well, I was going to deliver all this in two parts, uh, and I might just go ahead then a little bit and, and begin talking about the the, the second uh, part of what I'd hope to uh, uh, talk to you about today, um, and uh, consider furthermore uh, other aspects of the importance of peasants, or at least uh, the lower classes in general in English society. Uh, and one of the things that I, I would like to consider, um, and actually I think what we may um, save this for after the break, I'll leave you a question for after the break, uh, is how much of this world was interactive? You might now have the idea of these lords sitting alone in their castles not knowing anything about how the peasants live. You might think of the peasants living their secret lives, perhaps with their secret subversive rituals, off in the countryside, right under the noses of the Lord, or right under the butts of the bishop. Okay? How much did they know each other? I think this is an important question, because since most of our writing is preserved by the upper classes, does that writing in any way reflect peasant mentalities? Do some of these images, beyond the obvious purity images, do some of these festivals, beyond the obvious talking back festivals and subversive festivals, incorporate aspects of the lower class ways of looking at things? This is an important question for folklorists, uh, and I hope for everybody who's a medievalist uh, that I hope we're going to pursue in the second part of our discussion.